It's very good to be back here in Prague. I'm very pleased to be asked and by Professor Fialova uh, and for you all to be here. And very much, uh, thank you for, for being here. The topic is about exploring boundaries. I locate it in the city space, but I want to broaden it as well to see how it relates to various aspects of society as well. My particular interest about the urban space, the city, is not entirely only physical arrangements, but also the social arrangements. So for me, the, the two are always related. So that's the way I look at uh, the, the urban arrangements and, and analyzing and practicing and designing cities. So this is the structure of my talk. I'm going to say a bit about the nature of boundaries and what I mean by boundaries and territories that they define, uh, and then talk about how these boundaries are seen from either side, from different sides, and then talk about how these boundaries can be crossed by dialogue, by interaction. And with a particular emphasis on public space, I've worked a lot on the theme of public space. The public space is the, the main theme of the city for me because it is the glue, as, uh, uh, as you all know, that binds everything in the city together. Think of a city and you think of its public spaces. And the boundaries are the, the dividing lines between private territories and public spaces, and it's always a sh shade rather than uh, clear-cut dividing lines. So I start by some, uh, by the this is the first part, and I start by this uh, tour of this area in London. Uh, just a quick tour to, to show you what I mean. This area of Lewisham in, in London is a low-income area. And the reason why I took these pictures, these are, these are I, I just show you these, because I took these for another project that I'm doing, is this building that you see there is designed by the firm of Richard Rogers. And the reason I'm doing a case study of this building is because it is a temporary building. Temporary urbanism is one of the themes that I'm interested in. That means the temporary construction and use of space. And it's a trend that I'm studying. So this building that you see there is going to be there only for four years. It's built with a budget of five million pounds just for four years. And after that, it's going to be dismounted and relocated somewhere else. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, temporary homes for, temporary for, for homeless people. Now, I don't want to get into that aspect of this building. But then the pictures I took in that area, I'm showing you as just examples of what I mean by, by boundaries. And, and I just go up and down the high street here. What you see, and you can see it, this in any urban environment, and I'm sure you as, as practitioners of design are sensitive and know about it, but I just want to do, draw your attention. We have these physical boundaries that are very clear cut that prevent us from crossing into particular territories. We know where we cannot go because there is a physical boundary in front of us. And this is managing the movement of people through these physical barriers so you, can, you, you know where to go. There is also, you, you see the design of this building is um, allowing to the views and air to travel through it, but it is, um, there is a clear-cut boundary managed through the CCTV, through technology, to prevent that movement. So it is, is another barrier, which is for, uh, these technological barriers that we see everywhere uh, at work. We have legal boundaries. Look at this picture, you see all sorts of codes. It's a bus lane, you cannot go there if you are driving a car. There is an entrance to this fire brigade. There are these bollards, there are instructions. These are all boundaries that determine what we can do, what we cannot do. There are legal boundaries delivered and communicated through these symbols, these signs and symbols. We, we see them, we respond to them, 
We may decide to ignore them, but they are there. These are uh, coded and communicated to us. And there are symbolic values. This is a gesture. These, these uh, pots suggest a sort of a line the separating the building space from, from, the, from the pavement. And now, going back from that building to another part of the same street, you see this church is, has articulated, graded boundaries. It's a shaded entry to this place. So the boundary is not clear cut, is not harsh. And, and here is porous, it's a public library, although it's falling down because it's an area under, underfunded and uh, the, uh, suffers from all sorts of problems. But you see, it's a porous boundary. It's not preventing you. You can just walk in as you want. And this is another, it's a shop on this uh, street. It's an interactive boundary. It invites you to come and to, to touch these items that they put on the, on the pavement. It's not, again, a boundary that deters you. It's a boundary that wants to, to draw you in. And these, in these uh, street markets, the boundary is, is a bit unclear. It's, it's temporary. It's soft. And here, at the end of the high street, is a metro station it's a, that, that connects you to the city of London, where it's a very wealthy part of the city. So the connection between the poor part and the, the rich part is an invisible boundary. It is separating the two. So by showing you all this, I'm just giving you some impression of what I mean. Everything you can read in the city as a potential boundary. If you, and then depending on your particular abilities, that boundary is crossable or not, negotiable or not. If you are, for example, a disabled person, and you are going around on the pavements of the city, and suddenly there is a, there is a sort of a step that you cannot go because your wheelchair cannot go up, you are stuck this side of a very small step. So it is a boundary for you, which may not be felt or known by the others. The others may not at all see it. So you can read the city, if you like, in this way of a series of boundaries that, that every day we communicate and cross and go the other side or not. We don't know whether we are able to go or not. We, we all develop this understanding of these codes, of these limitations, of these places we, cannot, we can or cannot cross. And the more empowered you are to cross those boundaries, the, the better you're feeling about yourself. So when you're designing the city, if you like, designing places, if you think about the most, if you like, uh, vulnerable people who need to cross those boundaries, uh, you, you can empathize with them. You can provide for their, for their experience to be a better experience. Now, a city, these boundaries make distinctions, and these are pictures of very old cities that I want to show you that this idea of making distinctions, boundaries that separate functions, goes back thousands of years. This is in Mesopotamia 5,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, and, and the other one 4,000 in Crete, and this is the famous Agora. These are different um, places that are separated from each other. So you see this functional distinction between different places defined by boundaries is, going, is, the, is in the nature of the city. What you see on that uh, city of Ur, you see lots of boundaries separating functions, places, territories from each other. And this is, uh, is something that uh, the picture that you see there is something that I've been writing a paper about. This is the system that Berlin is now subdividing its spaces. It's moved from a system of subdivision based on engineering concepts to social concepts. How at each part of the city, each neighborhood, each area that they call Lebensraum is def defined in, in its social characteristics, also it, its physical characteristics. So what you see is I showed you a city made of distinctions. And I'm showing you the list that you see there are different ways that a city is made of different layers of distinction. 
you can see, you can read the city through the concentration of social groups. You know where uh, particular groups in your city live, particular uh, classes. There are distinctions in terms of age, ethnicity, wealth, citizenship, place of birth, political affiliation, voting patterns. People are making maps of these things. Scientists make a lot of cartography of these differences. But also we know in, in functions, land uses, landscapes, um, topography, historical periods, one of the ways of distinguishing between different par par parts of the city is layers of history. We know about built open spaces, medieval core, modern places, neighborhoods. These are all different ways that we read distinctions in a city. If you have a map of a city in front of you, there are so many different maps that you can make of a city, Build, depending on all these. And a lot of people, it's their life's job to make new cartographies of the city. How distinctions you can, how many distinctions you can you find? When you, there, is, there are elections, there are people who do cartography of election, who voted whom, in which part of the, of the city or the country. So that's one way of distinguishing and clearing, creating boundaries between places and identifying distinctions. And, and all sorts of others, you know, contour, maps of contour, maps of function, maps of land use. So a city is many layers of distinctions. And they're all made up by us, obviously, by, our, by us in the spatial disciplines that we are and affiliated disciplines, similar disciplines. But usually, we do it from above, from a bird's eye view. Now, this is obviously a more interesting picture of, of, a, of a city than this one. This is just a two-dimensional two flat. This is three-dimensional, giving you more detail. But still, this is something that is very uh, popular with with uh, urban designers, with architects, to look at places from the top, as if you are a bird flying, as if you are a helicopter flying over a place. And that creates a distance. If I can look at things from as if I am the god over a place, is it, it gives me one impression of a place. But there is also a, a an experiential sense of the place. So it's easy to draw boundaries at this level, from this perspective, than, than at this level. Although boundaries at this level also do exist. So we are talking about the difference between professional experiences that look at the things from the top and organize the, the, the spaces and identify boundaries from the bird's eye view, and we are talking about experiential, everyday experiences, that is personal, uh, personal eye level. And so you get, you, you get a different picture if you think about it phenomenologically, if you think about it from the point of view of a person that you are, and see how you experience a place. And that experience of a place is completely different from your professional judgment. Now, when you come to a school of architecture like this, you are trained to become a professional about it. And professional about, about space, about the city, about the building. And the professionalization... Now, there is, a, there is a French sociologist called Pierre Bourdieu that you may come across his work. And he talks about professions as tribes. He, he was originally an anthropologist, and he, he studies the, the professions as he did as, as tribes. In a way that, and he talks about how we are uh, innocent uh, young people. When we go into a university and become study a discipline, we are indoctrinated into a tribe, become member of a tribe. And we start thinking about the world along those lines. And that becomes entrenched in us. And it becomes difficult then for us to look at things from a different perspective. And that, that, that's the, one of the major problems, that then communication between people from different backgrounds, different skill levels, different disciplines, 
becomes a little bit difficult because you tend to think about things in a particular way, in a discipline. You develop vocabularies, mental images, skill sets, and particularly in design skills, uh, people start developing visual communication skills, spatial imagination, whereas in other disciplines, maybe just linear, verbal, and it's not the same. So we are talking about different ways of even communicating and, and thinking about things. And then bringing these together and linking them in a, in a thought process, it becomes difficult. But at the same time, we all have this experiential, phenomenological experience of the world, no matter how much we have been professionalized. So these two are always in us and maybe sometimes in sort of a tension with each other. Uh, but when you, when you look at something that, that separates these, what we see, that distinction between one discipline and another, between one way of looking at things and another, is then we define it as, as a binary, as a separate, as clear-cut distinctions. But they are usually interdependent in a sense that one thing is defined in relation to others. It's not, it's not a world in its own. It's not a separate world. It's part of a bigger picture. So what we have then, situations, that a boundary is the end of one thing, and start of another. At the same time, as that boundary is the place, the meeting place of these two, is a place of interaction as well as separation. So you can always see a spectrum where some people tend to see a clear cut line. So the city is a spectrum, really. And when we talk about public, we don't. We have a sense of the public, but there is always many publics in a, in a public. The public is not a single thing. We talk a lot about public space in our design practices, but do we know what the public is? The public is never a single homogeneous thing. It is so many different layers and shades to it. Um, so even within the public, there are many boundaries if you want to find them. This is a picture from the center of Madrid, where a public comes and it's formed that has this sense of collectivity. But within that public, there are so many different layers and publics. And the same goes with the private sphere. If you think about the private sphere, is it again a homogeneous and a single private? Um, now, I probably don't get into the discussions about what constitutes an autonomous individual and the, 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 the problems about opening up the private sphere, the sense of privacy. But ultimately, what you need, what, what I should perhaps be sufficient to say, is that, again, the sense of privacy is not a homogeneous. When I say me, this me is many things, it's not a single coherent thing. And, and there, it, so you can, the same level that you can de layer, there are so many layers of publicness, there are so many layers of privateness inside the person as well. So the same, that clarity and homogeneity is not there. It's always, you can open it up and, and like an onion, you can peel it and you can see how there are different layers to it. So when we talk about the boundary between the public and the private, this is a picture in West End of London, these famous uh, Bloomsbury squares, squares in the Bloomsbury district of London. These are private territories. They are owned by people, but they are publicly accessible. So there is something to be said about the clarity of these lines in terms of the legality of it. We, we, it's very difficult to cope with 
legal ambiguity. But it's easier, and we every day do it, that we cope with practical ambiguity. So this place is privately owned, but publicly used. So it's ambiguity in practice. Everybody can go through it. Everybody can come and sit. Everybody can use it and enjoy it. But the owners have not given up their ownership of it. Now, there are very complicated processes to make this coexistence of ambiguity and clarity possible. One of the problems we now have in cities, in city buildings, in the way that in recent decades development of the cities has evolved, is that private interest on the value of land is so strong that it does not want to allow this level of ambiguity because it wants that clarity of use. That's what we hear about privatization of public space that you may have heard about. And that means that that sense of the publicness that exists in places of ambiguity um, is reduced, and it becomes more controlled. It becomes more allocated to the private sphere. Now, when you do, as a designer, draw a boundary, you are engaging in a very powerful act. Of, it is an exertion of power. When you decide this should be a wall, even within a private territory, you are defining a territory. And a territory is something that allows and affords a series of actions and activities and excludes others. And that is a very important power, is an exercise of power. And obviously, is an exercise in creativity and communication. But a boundary is creating a, con a, a separation, as I said, but also a bridge. Um, it excludes as well as includes. So it's very important. It's very important to know who is doing that, who is drawing that boundary, and under what condition, on what basis. When I the, the design a space, I'm organizing it on a particular basis. And OK, within a private territory, if you are designing a house for a, a single family, let's say, you think it's, it's fairly, fairly straightforward. You are working with a particular household. They know their needs. You are working with them. It's within them, within their power to use it. But still, you are enforcing a degree of of power over how that household should organize its, its relationships. And when we are talking, and now I've, this is my, the emphasis my, of, my, of my talk here, is the relationship between a private territory and another, and the boundaries between them, and what, what is in between them, which is the public space, is, is very significant, where the boundaries are. Because this is in Birmingham. They, they made that uh, uh, bullring project. But you see, this the boundary of this bullring project and what the rest of the city as it, it is there, it creates a sense of imbalance. It's, it's a complete detachment of two spheres of life. It gives you the impression of a spaceship has landed here in the middle of poor, some, some sort of poor streets. It is. It is a boundary of the most uh, significant uh, force and, and it creates more of a dis separation rather than, rather than the possibility of, of, commu of communication and, and linkage. And we know about the problems of homelessness, which you don't have the public and private boundaries anymore. There is no such thing left in when people don't have a private territory to go to. Um, th this is um, from Los Angeles, but it could be anywhere. Now you go to the streets in, in the UK, there are increasingly people who live on the streets, street on, sleep on the street, and it's very dangerous as well. In, in warmer climes like this one, it's less dangerous, but in, in cold, cold places, people just simply die. So talking about public space and private space is 
fairly meaningless when we come to that level of, of, of problematic. There is no such boundary. They don't have a boundary. The boundary to, to protect them, to give them a sense of control over a particular territory and, and, and uh, self-worth. So, now we look at this, these spaces of the private and the public from the two sides of the boundary that divides them. This is a uh, slide I took in a, in a conference in Rome about public space. And this is the view from the public space. People who appreciate and value public space. And they say, why is it that public space is so small and private space is so big? That's the question. So when you look at it from the public space view, you see that the private space is expanding and the public space is shrinking. Now, it may be physically or it may be functionally. Now, physically is like this. This is your city here. I took many years ago from the top of that uh, uh, building. In, and it could be anywhere in the medieval texture is like that because it's encroachment of the private sphere into the public space. And because when the next time you build your house, you go a little bit further, you go a little bit further until somebody stops you. And usually they stop you at the absolute minimum that this space becomes allowable to pass through. But also, or there is a, a, an authority that enforces that. The medieval world was obviously within the walls. People had to compete for space hugely. And that the space of the medieval city that you see is the result of competition between forces for a limited space. And the public space shrinks to the minimum because that's, there's not enough space. And now we see something like that as well, that, the, that people are complaining that the private is expanding and encroaching onto the public, narrowing it down, making it smaller. And these are from London. The London Assembly published this report that you see on the left. They call it public life in private hands. And they complain about these controls of that, 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 that what appears to be public space is basically private territory, private property and limits what you can do, what can, you cannot do. And the quote and the, the picture you see on the right is the manifesto for public space that London mayor published. And the London mayor at that time is now the prime minister of the country, Boris Johnson. And that's what he says. And you wouldn't expect Boris Johnson, a right-wing politician, to say this, that there is a growing trend towards the private management of publicly accessible spaces. And this is... Uh, uh, causing concern. So Londoners can feel themselves excluded from parts of their own city. When you hear a right-wing politician talking about this, the way the city is changing, obviously there is something, it's not a left-wing uh, uh, radical talking. There is something serious here happening. And this is another example that you see that uh, that change in the balance of public and the private. This is from Liverpool. It's a project that uh, has won many architectural prizes. It's called Liverpool One. And what it does, it, it creates uh, a 42 and a half acre site that, uh, for, and it's given to, uh, it's, it's privatizing 35 streets in the city center. Uh, given for 250 years to a private uh, foundation to develop. So this changes the relationship of power, accountability, uh, and publicness in a city. Now, how do you evaluate these things? If you think about Liverpool, Liverpool was a very uh, successful city at one point, with 800,000 population, very vibrant port, 
it was the gateway to the America, and it was uh, a very, very uh, the biggest, the second biggest city in, in in the British Empire, and that sort of thing. And suddenly it collapses, loses population, loses half of its population, and there are many places that, are st if you visit, still left empty. So for years and years is in is in trouble. When a a, a, pr a private corporation comes and says, we're going to improve the conditions of your city. What do you say to them? It's a, it's a give and take. It's not straightforward. And the, the city authority that has had to live with, when I asked one of the people in the city council th about their strategy and what are they going to do about poor people in the city, he said, look, we've had our share of poverty for so many years. So they think that something has to be done. So if you were in their shoes, you might have done the same, but the result is, is not straightforward, is complex. And the consequences of the private control of the city center is not easy to foresee. And of course, we know commercialization that takes over the city and the, the public space becomes a, an advertising board. So, how, that, so it is public in a sense, but, but what, what level of publicness, the, the boundary becomes commercialized. And this is what I took last week in, in Vienna, that uh, it competes with St. Stephen's uh, Cathedral for attention, Chanel. So it's, a, it's, it's a, it, it, the symbolism, the vocabulary of expression in the city and the way the public space is organized and, and articulated it shows the character. Now, of course, this is not sufficiently uh, significant to, to uproot, if you like, the St. Stephen's Church and whatever it, it reflects. But, but it, it is a sign of, of changing time. And there's a picture from Tokyo that you see that in this district, this particularly, they in, encourage this sort of buzz of advertising to bring the city to life, and um, it's the character of the place. And this is a, the, the, the quotation, uh, I examined this as a PhD, this is the center of Nottingham, a big, big uh, English city, and it's the main s square of the city. And the, the, the change that we see in the character of the cities and the balance between the public and private is such now that the city authorities now think of themselves as a private uh, corporation as a private organization and think of the space of the city as a as something to make money with and so here you see uh, is a quote from a city's public planner it says this space is private property we rent it out on a rent rental basis and this is if you went through this you had a different idea you would have a different idea this is the main public space of the city now, the idea, again, this is from the Bloomsbury area of London. These are very beautiful squares. And uh, if you, uh, they've, been, they've been well praised in many architectural history books. Uh, and the Im image of a place that is open, accessible, enjoyable, is, is the image that we have of public space. But the same space is, is for hire. Uh, for, for events, because the, the municipality of Camden, which runs these places, is, needs to make money to, to survive. Now, the quote on the right that I have there for you is from Octavia Hill. Octavia Hill was a social reformer in the 19th century, and she is the founder of National Trust, and she was a campaigner for public space. So what we are talking about has a very long history. It's not just now that people talk about the, the significance of public space. And what she says is that the urban poor have two wants, want of space and want of beauty. And then she talks about you cannot really separate yourself from your neighbors, accept them, uh, at the noble aim of making them uh, such that you shall not desire not separation but union. So it's a campaign for creation of public spaces. So th at that time, people start developing and improving public spaces because they know it cannot go on forever that some people 
have an expanding private sphere and others are a, a, short, a, a squeezed existence. But at the same time, there is pressure on public budgets. This is about maintenance of uh, public parks in England. And the, the budget is going to be cut. It's being cut all the time, despite the fact that they are very popular with people. And there is a problem. So when we have this image of public space being available, being accessible, being provided, uh, public parks for 200 years have been provided, but at the same time we have this problem of how do we pay for it, how do we maintain it? And the, the public local facilities. Now you, you may have heard about the, the decline of high streets. They have to compete with online shopping. So high streets are the backbone of neighborhoods and cities in the UK. The Americans have this term of Main Street. The British have the term High Street. It's the central spine around which the, the, in the past they used to have local facilities, shops and facilities that a locality uses. Now they are in decline, they are in trouble because they have to compete with online, they have to pay high rents and they cannot, they cannot remain. And obviously, partly also because the oversupply of these shops. And the term gentrification is used in these changes of relationship between the public and the private. This is a picture from Tokyo. There is a developer in Tokyo, Mr. Mori, uh, who developed this area, Rapongi Hills. And his motto, his, he is a, he's a tower builder. And his motto is that he wants to turn Tokyo into Manhattan. Now, already Tokyo has many tall buildings. But he wants to pave the city with tall buildings. Now, if you look at Tokyo's uh, urban scene, you see tall buildings along the main roads and, and some places, concentrations of tall buildings. But he wants to, to turn it entirely. So in this project, he creates this, and he calls it gentrification. Now, gentrification is a term I don't know how much you use in, in Prague. But it's a, it's a highly charged term, some places use it without any trouble. That you improve an urban area, what you do, it, the quality goes up. The quality goes up, the prices go up, some people cannot stay, they have to go. It's gentrified, it's improved physically and socially, but then you, you don't think about people who had to leave. That's, the, that's the, and obviously that's a, social, that's a problem that cannot be easily ignored. But in this case, Mr. Mori is happy to ignore. Now, if you look at, I was talking about how the private interests may be seen to encroach the public space. Now, if you look at it from the private sphere, that is, in a sense, sometimes it's felt to be in fear of others. This is a picture from Dublin. It's a regeneration project on the left in the industrial areas where a new scheme has been developed. Oh, this is not new anymore, but it, it was. On the right-hand side of that picture is a, still a poor district, poor working-class district. And working classes, post-industrial working-class districts are real in social troubles because they don't have much, 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 much jobs to do and things. So, the kids from this side throw stones at the new wealthier development that has cropped up next door to them because obviously they, it, they are feeling inferior now. They put the mesh on top of the wall even to protect the left from the left side of this wall from the right side. And the kids now call it the Berlin Wall because it's a separation, it's, the, it's a clear expression of inequality as expressed in physical form and as felt by the two sides and experienced every day. And this is from Los Angeles again, that the boundary that in this case is just managed by stones and meshes, 
in this case, is, is managed by armed response, <coughs> by guns. And it's just basic, it's, it's not something that you cannot, it's, it's very common. You go around some parts and this is what you see, that if you stop, step over this boundary, you'll be killed easily. And no, there's no uh, legal problem for the person who killed you. And this is from South Africa. And many other places have these gated neighborhoods where the fear of the other within the private sphere it relate, re refers and re leads to these additional boundaries that are set up. That um, the, the, the urban environment is a collection of separated places which don't have related, don't have relations to each other. They protect each other, protect themselves from each other. And there's a lot of that around the world now, but particularly very uh, severe examples are in South Africa. And this is again in South Africa. That, that, that was the first time I saw electric fences on top in, in uh, homes, residential buildings. They are separating themselves with electric fences. And because they are afraid for reasons or without a reason. But what we see then, we see the boundary is being hardened by walls, by fences, by electrification, by armed response. And that is another way of thinking about distinctions between different places. Now, none of this is part of a design project. These are all added as people live in these areas. These are not well, apart from the, the, the gated neighborhood, which is designed as such. But the others are usually added through the experiences of fear. And we know about the problem of surveillance, that again, the private sphere is because of the new technologies uh, that we have, a, the, the boundaries are, are blurred. And this is a picture that I just took off the internet that is an interesting way to show the fear of the private sphere no longer being a private sphere. It's open, it's, it's exposed. It, what you feel that you are behind the wall, you're not inside a protected zone as such. You are, ex you are visible. And that visibility, that exposed existence is, is something that people um, are getting used to every day. So that sense of the distinction between the public and the private, although it was never clear cut, it was always a shade, is now you see from either side the encroachment into the public sphere and the encroachment into the private sphere. So what we see is blurred boundaries, loss or the, the, uh, change in all sorts of distinctions that we still hold as, as our, in our thinking processes. But in practice, we are living different lives. So this is my last section of the talk. And it's about uh, the boundaries, uh, how to cross or relate across, from across these boundaries. Now, a little bit about economy, I'm afraid. Um, if you look at the, the European documents about the future of European economy, they talk about a knowledge-based economy. That because the, the economic products have changed from physical objects now to digital streams, and um, there is the globalization, the division of labor now, with industrial jobs, industrial technologies, industrial products are somewhere else, manufacturing is somewhere else. And now there is emphasis on the creative economy, on, on the creative sector, on science and technology, but also on the uh, creative types of jobs. Uh, creative economy like design and all sorts of cultural products that are used are now a big part of the, the modern economies that they look at them as basic in the economic uh, functions, creative functions that can uh, 
be the basis of a knowledge-based economy. When you hear knowledge-based economy, usually it talks about science and technology. But knowledge-based economy also is based on, on culture and, 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 and creativity in, in cultural activities. So it, this is another form of knowledge, this is another form. So knowledge is not entirely scientific and, and, and technological, but also cultural and artistic. So the core of this knowledge economy is innovation. And innovation is what is generation of new ideas. When you come up with a new idea, you innovate it, which is always the case in a design process. In a design project, you come up with a new idea, a new idea which relates to a particular circumstance, to a particular problem. How does innovation come about? In these economic theories, they talk about innovation as the result of the meeting of minds. And by that, they mean people from different backgrounds, different skills, different perspectives when they all come together, sit around, around a particular problem, not uh, just, uh, just a chat, but also that chat uh, is, is the foundation for the possibility of innovation. Um, and on that basis, they talk, people talk about multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, all sorts of terms. Multi is when a number of disciplines come together. So, for example, in a project you have architects, you have engineers, you have uh, planners, you have um, ec ec economists, uh, real estate ex experts. It's a big, pro big project has, has to have a number of different skills together. So this is a multidisciplinary. Everybody comes from their own disciplinary knowledge and function. So you have a multidisciplinary team. When they say interdisciplinary, they mean when you get together, you go beyond your own limited, if you like, expertise, and you start exploring new things that don't exist in our individual disciplines. So you develop new areas. So you can cross those boundaries in inter and, and transdisciplinary activities. But ultimately, the message is this, that innovation, which is the generation of new ideas, is based and facilitated by the interaction of different minds, when people from different backgrounds can come together and negotiate. Now, it's not the only way that innovation happens, but this is something that facilitates it and accelerates it. And this is one of those things that you see the design of these, all these big uh, uh, high-tech firms. The design is like that. Nowadays, the design of universities is like that. To go away from clear-cut disciplinary design to much more interactive spaces where people can come across each other and bump into each other and talk about... I've, uh, went to uh, two summer schools in Italy. They have this uh, initiative called in, uh, uh, the, the, between the two polytechnics, Polytechnic of Milan and Polytechnic of Turin. That in this, there is a, they have a summer school. They select a number of very good students from across the two uh, polytechnics, from across different disciplines. And they bring them all together in a summer school in a week or a week long, uh, or, or I think two, two week uh, session, and give them particular problems to solve. So they may be sitting around the table from medicine, from engineering, from architecture, from humanities, from philosophy, from sociology, and together they create, although these polytechnics are more technological, they have less humanities in them. But still, they are given particular problems to address. And how do you address them? Even if it's not something, definitely it's not something that you've thought about. If you are a medical researcher, you, you haven't thought about how to regenerate an alpine village. 
which is suffering from the loss of business as a result of change in skiing habits, which was one of the problems. So you, you are given a problem, but, and the idea is that the meeting of these minds may generate new ideas. Now, that's one form, but sometimes these things are much more clearly defined, the problems. These high-tech companies, they, they, they work on that, that basis a lot. Now, there is a system of innovation that is mediated through technology. We now know we can communicate across the world with people in different parts of the world and work together on a project. And um, if, you've, if you've visited other universities or you have joint projects with colleagues from, from other universities, or you will have in the future, you know how it works. You just communicate through the medium of this uh, technology. But people talk a lot about face-to-face, -face, the, the value of face-to-face, -face, because the face-to-face -face is still the strongest and the most uh, potent way of creating energy. And face-to-face, -face, interpersonal relations are still the most important way of coming up to new dynamics. Communication through, through technology is, is useful, but limited. It doesn't allow you to linger. It doesn't allow you to explore in depth. But face-to-face -face does. And that's why there, there's a lot of emphasis now in the de development of innovation clusters, innovative clusters, because it creates a critical mass of people in an area it creates the possibility of connection, accidental encounters. So you see there is a lot of work. Science parks are now very much uh, promoted everywhere. Now, I, I, I talk about science park, the design of science park a bit. The cultural quarters you see, and I'll show educational districts. University is a place of such accidental encounters, possibility of. But the idea is that the dialogue, encounter, people coming together, they cross the boundaries that separate them in disciplinary terms, in frameworks that they have, in their terms of their knowledge and skills, and they can, they can come up with new ideas and new solutions for the problems that they have. Now, this is an image of the Silicon Valley, the famous Silicon Valley. It's just, a, uh, just you drive around. It's a big, big suburb, basically. There are some towns, like Palo Alto and the rest of it, but essentially is a huge suburb south of San Francisco and, and, and uh, San Jose. It, it, it created this cluster through various reasons, but if you read, uh, I mean, in geography, they talk a lot about cr cr uh, in, uh, the subject of geography, human geography. They talk a lot about, particularly in, in economic geography, talk about clusters. Just think about your city, the city that you are familiar with, and you can identify clusters of functions within it. And historically, it was the case that from the medieval times, there, there was a cluster of watchmakers, there was a cluster of shoemakers, or that sort of thing. The, the, the city that becomes big it creates clusters of functional distinction, functional specialism within it. Now they talk about clustering of innovative businesses, high-tech companies. And they want to do it through public policy. And in this case, there was no such public policy. It was just gradual <coughs> accumulation of these firms around the uh, University of Stanford. But that suburban character now has become the bottle that many uh, science cities around the world are built on. And they think that, I, I, I listened to a presentation by a Russian um, planner who was talking about how they are planning a science city, but their perception of the science city was like a, a fortress of these uh, scientists or separated from the world and completely detached and given the space to innovate. Whereas really, they, 
this, this perception is, is a wrong way of to, to look at it. And if it happened that in Northern California, it ended up being a suburban space, it does not follow that everywhere else it should be similarly a suburban place, a, 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 a science park, a cluster of high tech. But sometimes these things are not really practical. They're sometimes branded, sometimes they are hopeful creations. They put a series of places together expecting that to happen and sometimes become an, an elite enclave, which is not productive. Because if you think, again, in, in, in economic theory, there is this idea that the basis of the economy is those practices that can generate hard currency for you. What the, the goods and services that you can sell to the outside world and bring you hard currency. And there are others who serve these people. So you have a two-tier mentality. People who matter firsthand and people who serve them. So doctors and architects and, and lawyers are all serving those people who generate hard currency. That is the kind of traditional mentality of this particular economic theory. But it's a wrong way of looking at it. Because how did they come become able to sell something to generate that income. Because they were drawing on this infrastructure of, of services and, and talents. And so it's a, it's a texture that creates that capacity rather than those small group of individuals and companies that are creating that capacity and that uh, hard currency. This is a, another story. I don't want to get into that. but. Basically, what I'm arguing is that we are talking about interconnection of different activities. So when you hear about people talking about the creative class as if they are a separate species that the others have to serve them, don't believe that because it's not a, a, a group of elite people who generate those things. It's the entire texture of that, that particular society, that particular condition that is coming up with this innovation. Now, these are some examples, some images of these places. It's uh, the cultural in, uh, creative industry clusters that they are promoting in different cities, in different parts of the, parts of the world, in, in the UK. Uh, this is a group of museums in central London that they put together. A br I mean, this is a brand of cultural quarter Part of it is branding and promoting. Part of it is sharing resources and experiences. You see, in the city of Leicester, the, it becomes entirely then <coughs> driven by, by branding rather than really has this changed the culture of Leicester as a, as a very vibrant um, city. Not so sure, but they, they, this is part of it, the, the way it happens in, in, in various parts of the world. That, that district in, in Beijing, 798 district, is an old in the, the declining industrial area. They've turned it into a cultural hub and uh, a very interesting, pleasant place. But um, it's, it, it's the possible, it's a cultural space that, that it's possible to bump into other people, other interesting activities. This is a cultural district in another part of China, in Wuhan. So you see everywhere around the world we have these initiatives, creating clusters of science and technology in the name of science parks, creating clusters of cultural and creative activities in the name of cultural districts, so that you create a critical mass of economically vibrant and creative possibilities. And this is another part is, is in London, uh, in Shoreditch in London, which happened by accident that they call it a, a silicon roundabout. But now the question is, this is from ancient Athens, which one comes first? Is the private sphere the basic unit of the city and the public comes after it, connecting it? 
or is the public space the core of the city and the private bits are carved out of it? And uh, with, uh, the public institutions that we see in, in so it's a, it's a, it's not one or the other. Obviously, the city is interconnected. And just imagine, I saw a, a map of a city. I think it was in Albania after the collapse of the socialist system, that the land was subdivided into parcels and sold. But the way it was done, no street was provided. So you had parcels that you could not reach. People who bought it, they bought a piece of desert or whatever it was, or open land. And they didn't know that there was not going to be a, a street. But without a street, which is public space, you cannot access your personal territory. So it's a necessity to have a system of public spaces in a city. But the more of it, the better. And I'll show you some examples of it. Um, so I'm not going to talk much about modern city reformers who their ideas, if you, if you look at the, uh, I, I, I say a few words, if you look at the manifesto of the modern movement, the Charter of Athens, 1933, they talk about four functions of the city, and the public space for them is a space of recreation. They don't have a clear idea of a space of sociability. And interestingly, if you read that book that uh, Le Corbusier wrote, that he talks about Parisian cafes, as these mushrooms that have grown up in the city, they need to be cleared. We will re relocate the Parisian cafes to the top of the buildings so that the streets can be cleared nicely for the, for the cars to pass through. So that mentality is against uh, the sort of space of sociability. But at the same time, you see from the 19th century in, in countries like the, the, the United Kingdom that because of this world of individual, uprooted individuals, a lot of public institutions start to be developed, like libraries, like parks, like a lot of um, other public institutions that now we know about. This is a quote from Alberti. Alberti is a, a Renaissance architect. He's one of the theorists of, theorist of architecture in, in Renaissance. And he talks about a forum is that it's an in, enlarged crossroad. So you think about public spaces in the city as a crossroad where people come across each other. And many cities have grown from crossroads where the roads have met and a market has formed and the city has grown around it. So the, the, the or origin of the city is sometimes just a crossroad. And that is giving you an indication of what comes first and what, what is the, 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 the nucleus of, of the city. And this is the building designed by Alberti. So what makes a place public is really its accessibility so that you can cross the boundaries. So the question is, is it possible? Is it accessible physically and socially? inside it, activities, information, opportunities in that space, are they available? And if they are available, and of course, it's not, again, it's not clear cut, it's always shaded. There's nothing that is absolutely public, there's nothing that is absolutely private. There's always shades of it. But we see these, um, this is in Paris, but it could be in Prague, where you have the, the this a system of boundary articulation that between the private and the public territories, you create these soft edges that the two sides can mingle rather than be harsh. Uh, and it is a suburban, uh, is a new town, is a garden city in, in a, uh, outside London. So the, the boundary between the public and the private is, is unclear, or it's clear, but it's, it's not harsh, it's soft. And this is an American porch, which is again the same principle, the, a boundary which is articulated so that the two sides can communicate. We are not talking about 
absolute separation. But when you get to South Africa, where the fear of crime, the fear of the other, fear of the situation that you are not sure about, that same space steps back, becomes hardened. That's boundary. And it goes with social inequality that has grown. The more social inequality, the harsher these boundaries, because different parts of the society do not relate to each other, are afraid of each other. And these are quotes from different organizations that talk about inequality. And now these are, I mean, I'm coming to the end of my talk here and with these examples. This is uh, in Milan, a housing scheme designed by the firm of Zaha Hadid. Beautiful to look at. And but what I want to show you in this scheme, uh, this is, uh, now, they said it was higher density than they really wanted it, so there are some debates about it. But still, nevertheless, it's a beautiful object. Uh, what I wanted to show you is this. How this, and you can also see it here, this space is separated from the street by quite a sharp edge with a sense of a fortress separation. So you have a, you have a gate like a very dominate, dominating gate. It's a, it's a gated compound in a way. Now, look the other side of the same street. This is banal architecture, not high uh, reputation, global reputation. It's just banal, normal, modernist architecture. The edge, it still is a physical edge. You cannot enter, but it makes a much more civilized contribution to the street that it makes the, the passing through this pavement a much more pleasant experience than this one. You just feel that you are excluded, whereas here, you, you feel that you, there's some contribution. Now, we go back a generation in the same city, in Milan, and these are 1950s, 60s developments, new towns, new areas. It's an area called QT, QT8. Uh, and you see the generosity of public space, that the spaces that you can meander, you can just go in, the amount of space that is available, that is not secluding others, it is space available to, to anybody who passes. And the sense of generosity you get here, although it's, it's not to say that this is an ideal form, this is an ideal comp composition, but it, is, it was an experiment at the time that it was developed. But you see the completely different mentalities about the relationship between the public and the private, about the accessibility of space, about the boundaries between the two, and the character that that gives to the sense of the city. What sort of a city do you, when you walk around the city and you see electrified fences on, on response, or you go around and you see green spaces that you can walk into. It's a completely different experience of the city. And that, that sense of designers, and, and it's not up to the designers entirely only, of course, it's a very complicated uh, processes involved. Many different people are involved in in how a society becomes one like this or the other. But ultimately, when you are given the task of distinguishing between the ter two territories, you have many possibilities, many options. And the more if you, uh, articulate and interpenetrating and, 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 and richly developed that you can manage that boundary, the more you contribute to the richness of that city, that experience of people on either side of that fence. So the boundaries, and this is the very, very last slide, I'll just uh, sum up. Boundaries define, facilitate, and limit access to various places and activities. They reflect power relations, character, and conditions of the society. Uh, in unequal societies, you see harsher boundaries, but they are not just rigid dividing lines to protect fixed territories, but sites of interaction where new possibilities may be explored. As I was trying to say, 
innovation is the result of crossing those boundaries. Softer, richly uh, developed cities are the result of those boundaries that are articulated and well thought rather than quickly separated in the easiest and the laziest way. So, thank you very much. Thank you for a wonderful lecture about uh, what borders and boundaries are about. And uh, questions, if anybody has questions. There were many examples of the different uses and different ways how the, these boundaries uh, uh, physically exist in the cities. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about the status, because I mean the public space and the private space, they always were a representation of status. And there is some, there seems to be some kind of a change of how do you show the status today in a city. And I was thinking about these, um, the Louis Vuitton uh, suitcases mm. and the Chanel very aggressive yeah. um, billboard. Mm. Uh, is, that a, is that about power or is it about status or what is it about? Well, that power and status are two, two, two different versions of the same, yes. So, um, status, expression of status is the expression of symbolic power. So even the, the financial wealth is translated into symbolic power. So in the sense that, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a combination of these th different things. These big corporations like Chanel and, and the rest of it, they want to be present everywhere. They are not just, they just, they just, they don't just want to be seen to be powerful. They want, obviously, to sell their products. So they want to be present everywhere, and they just think about various ways. And if they can cover a big square of, of Paris or Vienna, they do. Whatever they do. Louis Vuitton now is in the, in the business of luxury hotels. And I was uh, asked to go to this PhD examination in, in Paris. I couldn't go. There is a student who is studying how the luxury brands can then use their uh, reputation, which is symbolic asset for them, to get into new businesses. Um, there is a place in, um, in uh, Milan that they've created a space, of a retail space, which is a little back garden with, with, with un, very unremarkable, but they put together different, different retailers in two, three floors, and a nice, uh, quick, uh, small garden. Um, and that, that has become a brand of a particular form of retail. And now they are going to various countries and sell that brand, which is basically a very banal arrangement of shopping units in a pleasant environment. But they turn it into a, a symbolic asset and then use it. In the same way now, Louis Vuitton use it in a way, Louis Vuitton is, is able to build a, a museum in Bois de Bologna, where it was not allowed to build. Uh, but now, they, because of their power, they can. And they've said, the way they've stayed, they're doing it, they say, we do this museum, which praises us, for the city. We give it to the city, that sort of thing. So, it's obviously, it's expression of power but also is an expansion and extension of a business. How do the media uh, mediate this? Because it's a lot about virtual images just circulating around. Yeah. That is a change also. Yeah, the yeah, that's right. And of course, they, these big, big uh, players, they use all the various media that they can, they, from street uh, signs to me, uh, the virtual, virtual presence. Um, I examined, I 
just keep referring to PhDs that I've read and examined and, and supervised. The, I examined the PhD in, in uh, Helsinki. And this, the, it was about this firm, JC Deco, that is a French company. I don't know whether you've paid any attention to the signs around your town or any town you go. Most towns in Europe, more, most major cities in Europe at least, you see JC Deco in the, in the advertising signs around the city. It's a huge company. And what they did with the city of Helsinki, they signed the contract to say, we build for you uh, bus stops. Uh, what, uh, but if you allow us to, to use the side of it for JC Deco, and we collect, we, we, we make you good quality bus stops. So this dissertation was about how, whether the city made any um, benefit from this. Because if, what, what was the case if they had done it themselves? And what are the revenue uh, income that, that the, from the advertising that JC Deco makes of these places? So this is a kind of a situation of controversy. The city thinks, OK, we get brand new bus stops. Who cares about these billboards? But, and of course, the city is not in a position to advertise anything themselves as such. But what the, uh, the result is that JC Deco is only interested in places where advertising matters. So some parts of the city, you don't want really to advertise. There's no customers in those parts that want to use the, the things that you advertise. So it creates in, uh, inconsistency, inequality in terms of the provision of bus stops in the city. So that, 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 that's the sort of presence in the public space of commercial activities and commercial powerful actors that can cross different cities and countries uh, is that that was one of the uh, expression of that another question thank you good evening thank you for the presentation um, assuming that we are or we are at the faculty of architecture so i guess most of the audience are architects what would you say that um, architects should like what we heard and and saw from your presentation what would you say that uh, architects should do or maybe better shouldn't do to to um i don't know achieve more equality in public space and so on mm. well it's difficult to say because we are talking about complicated processes city making any any place that you make any place that you design and it's, it's not a straightforward, simple thing. It's, if you are a, a painter, you can decide, this is my space, I paint on it whatever I want. But if you are an architect, you, are, you have to work with lots of different forces. And so it's not entirely up to the architect to make, to change society. But what the architects can do can be aware of these things, rather than saying, we are we are artists that we don't know about these things. These are not our concerns. Or say that, oh, we are uh, employed technicians, whatever our client says we do. If they are citizens, then they, have, they need to be aware of these things. Now, of course, what they do, everybody in any, with any skill would have to do what they think is best. So there's no solution to every problem. There's no single solution to every problem, and there is no recipe to say, oh, you shall do this. It's, it's pointless to say that. But if you are aware of the, the risks, of the possible consequences, of the intended and unintended outcomes of what we do, then we will do things knowingly. Doing things knowingly is much better, sometimes not so better, but nevertheless, knowing is always better than not knowing. So that's what, what I would urge the architects, like any, like any other profession to, to do, is to try to know. So there are things that, that, we, that we pass through and we don't pay any attention. They, are, we, they, they seem to us to be simple, natural processes, but they are not. Or they, so it's, it's getting to know these things, getting to be aware of the world around us. That's, so, in a sense, if, if I live all, all the time in a, 
in an area that has no sign of deprivation, which is likely to be the case with many architecture students. They don't have any sense of uh, problems that some other people may have. I have colleagues uh, who are in this temporary construction of things. They get a group of students to build a temporary structure as a meeting place for, it's just, so the students get to learn a little bit about how to construct something. Um, in an area which is a series of buildings where low income old people live. So these are lonely people often with limited ability to go out or to know much about or be able to do anything because they are old, limited physical ability, limited money to do anything, to go. So their, their world is really limited. So these people, my colleagues, these two colleagues, take the group of students, they set up the structure in the, in the space of this compound as a place of meeting for a place to, for, for these people to get together to have tea with it together, coffee together. So this is a process that may be, may be seen to be a pointless process. This is a structure that will disappear soon, but it's really a valuable process because first it gets these, it, it helps these old people to get a little bit of a, a little bit of fresh air from the outside, these young people coming and doing something for them so they have a good sense about it, although it's not going to last long, but at least it's better than nothing. So they get together to know each other a little bit more. And for these young people, designers, architects, who go out of their comfort zone, go to, out of their middle-class bubble and see another part of the world, that they don't usually, they never go to see that. So I would say knowing, get to know other parts of the same city that you may never come across. It's, it's valuable exercise. It's, uh, it's, it's something that uh, everybody has to do once in a while at least. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question after uh, what my colleague was asking before. Um, we are architects. Um, let's say we are aware of the um, the threats uh, you just uh, showed us. There are also municipalities uh, issuing building codes that uh, try to work uh, smart with uh, define the borders. Uh, their character and how architects should deal with them. Um, but we are operating in environment uh, with ever increasing uh, in, uh, in, in equality. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm wondering, do you have any um, real life positive example of um, architects or municipalities um, really softening the problems that are actually much deeper and really uh, structural social uh, problems going much deeper than what actually yeah. architects or municipalities yeah. usually have uh, a yeah. chance to um, influence things. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it was I mean, there, there are many, many, there are many, many good examples of people trying to make a difference uh, whenever they can at, at all levels. So it's not... Uh, it's not a bleak picture. It's, these are threats, but there are many responses to that, and there are many positive responses. If you, if you look at the examples of the uh, architectural prizes recently given in, in the UK, RIBA given, they are given to social projects that, that they've, when groups of young people, young architects have worked with, uh, I don't know, people of a street to improve the conditions of that street, that sort of thing. So it are, there are many people, many energies that are used in, in, in socially useful ways. And, uh, and there are many municipalities also that, that try to... to, to so it's not, it's not blanket condition. And different, different locations have different conditions. 
and they start from different places. The, the, the degree of inequality is different in different places. So it's not, it's not all the same. And our, I guess the, 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 the extent of, of response also varies. I was wondering about uh, some really uh, deeply divided societies uh, where the small scale um, interventions somehow um, um, change the situation you know, soften the impact, the negative impact, the, uh, the deep structural uh, crisis uh, caused. Mm. Well, you know, not, not a small single interventions making a posi positive deviation islands, but really like making a real change through uh, small interventions. Making a real change with a small intervention? Well, with the uh, single interventions or by municipality issuing a smart yeah. codes well, that would help? Well, I, I cannot co co quote from top of my head uh, now uh, an example that uh, I, I, but I mean, just to just look at the example that I first started with, the, the building of housing for the homeless. Although there are questions about it, of the, the opportunity cost, the way that money has been spent. But ultimately, you see a local uh, a district, district municipality in London which has a problem of homelessness, decides to do something about it and build good quality modular housing of the sort that usually is not available to homeless families and making it available to them, albeit on a temporary basis. But still, it is, it is if you like, a positive step in, in some ways. The problem of, the pro these, these sorts of problems are not the sort of problems that you can turn a key and it gets solved. There is constant, constant. it needs constant pr pressure and also from all sorts of levels of society. It's not a single municipality or a single person or a single community. But there are many commun community projects, civil society projects that people get together to try to, to sort out some, some of these problems. There are many um, <coughs> projects of yeah, housing usually uh, is a lot. At one point, the role of architecture was entirely seen as provision of housing some years ago when they wanted to be socially influential. The, the modernist manif manifesto that I, Charter of Athens, 1933, primarily is about housing, improvement of housing. But, but, and there are still many groups, many social enterprises, many philanthropic organizations, many municipalities, many national states that try to do something.